yeah, getting this thing started, how would you describe what it is exactly that you do or maybe what exactly you talk about on your channel? You're asking hard questions already. Um, <laughs> getting right I into it. I don't really think about it too much, but um, I've... I've recently described myself as a spiritual coach, uh, which I think is pretty good description. I guess I'm I'm wanting to uh, help facilitate positive change in people's lives. Mm. I like it. So on that note, this might be another tough one. What is spirituality because that is quite an umbrella term you know it's quite a generic term we could say to you what is spirituality and how do you coach in that way yeah good question so um so i would just distinguish it from the material uh so so spirituality would be that which is concerned with the spirit that being which is non-material um, it gets a bit tricky because ultimately the material is also of the spirit, but it's the, for me, spirituality is looking at the causes which are inward or subjective, non-material, uh, causes of, of our experience. Mm. It's a pretty succinct definition. I like that. Mm. Yeah. So let's tackle it this way. Usually what are the. I guess, quandaries or questions or guidance that people seek from you, you know, like, uh, how do you lead them on this path? Well, uh, people have all kinds of challenges that they're dealing with in their lives. And uh, so that could be, uh, you know, people can have all kinds of, maybe they perceive that they're struggling with anxiety, or maybe they perceive that they're struggling with a health challenge, or maybe they perceive that they're having some relationship challenge, or maybe uh, they feel like they're challenged with their creative expression, or uh, maybe they're seek just seeking for a lot, so sometimes not so much these days, but still sometimes I get people who are seeking for enlightenment. I don't know if I ever talked about it in those terms, but certainly uh, it's, it's a way that a lot of people think about it. So they're looking for enlightenment and they've got all kinds of ideas about what that's going to mean. Um, I think oftentimes, certainly what, what I was looking for, and I, I think what a lot of people are looking for is basically just an escape hatch. Uh, it's like, my life is too difficult. I feel too afraid and, uh, and overwhelmed. And I just want to be able to get to this better place. Mm. And enlightenment sounds like that. So uh -huh. give me that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, what that leads to is a lot of uh, fruitless searching, because if a person doesn't know what they're actually looking for, then their chances of finding it are very slim. Uh, it's one of those fundamental things in reality is if, if you don't know what you're looking for, you're not going to find it. So first step is to clarify what you're looking for. Mm. Um, and so that's why I don't... I. I now think of it in terms of self-realization, which is, and I can define that for me, it's self-realization is to know who I am, to know what my powers are, and to know what my relationship with reality is. Mm -hmm. And that's available to everybody. Everybody can achieve that because you already are, you already are, mm -hmm. and that's the foundation. So it's possible for you to recognize that. And then it's possible for you, and you have experience, so it's possible for you to recognize the nature and structure of your experience, mm -hmm. which is reality. And then, which means understanding your powers, and then thereby you understand your relationship with reality. Mm. You, know that, you know that you exist, and you know the structure of your experience, thereby you know your relationship with that. Mm. Yeah. So how do you recommend we go about, um, you know, diving into self-realization? Do you recommend any general practices or modalities? Um, yes. 
Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I could, I could recommend, I, and I do sometimes on a case by case basis, I can recommend specific things. Um, but in general, I recommend, uh, practicing self-awareness mm -hmm. and that's, um, and then the, in terms of a technique for that, because it's, it's one thing to say, just be aware of yourself, but, um, most people don't know where to start with that. So as a starting point for that, I recommend breath awareness because breath awareness mm -hmm. is available to everybody and it's very powerful because uh, the breath is the breath is something that is always happening, I mean more or less. And um, it is something that if we allow it, then it's given. So you don't actually have to do the breath. But it's also something that there's commonly a mechanical overlay that's running the breath. So it gets over, it's, it's, it's the, um, the breath is done by habit. And that habit is largely unconscious. We can also do it consciously. Obviously, you could, you know, do box breathing, count, you know, in yeah. four, hold four, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, but most of the breathing that most of us are doing most of the time is mechanical, habitual, but it's unconscious. Mm -hmm. It's just determined by all of the conditioning. So, you know, I've had this, I've had all these experiences. Those experiences have conditioned me to react to things in my life in certain ways. And I manage all of that through how I'm unconsciously breathing. Mm. So I'll hold my breath or I'll breathe rapidly or I'll breathe shallowly or I'll breathe deeply. And all of that's being done unconsciously trying to manage the experience. Mm -hmm. But yeah. if, but by just being aware of the breath and then allowing that mechanical overlay to release the underlying breath that is gifted is revealed. And the beauty of that is multifold actually, but one of the, the wonderful things about that is that it actually will release the conditioning. Not necessarily all in one fell swoop, although that could happen, but that's uncommon and maybe not all that desirable because that could be pretty shocking, yeah. but slowly it will release that conditioning. Mm. Yeah. Well said. The breath is very powerful for sure. And very simple in that way as well. Yeah. Um, so the essence essentially is to bring your awareness to the mechanical habit of the breath and then to sort of translate that awareness into other facets of our life as well. So if you can do it with the breath, then you can also become aware of pretty much everything that we are habit formed around. Is that the essence? Yeah, I mean, it should happen automatically because, uh, so, so for example, I used to have a, an enormous amount of anxiety that I was running from, and mm -hmm. therefore it was running my life. And uh, so having awareness of the breath allowed me to then notice what the actual nature of that anxiety was because the actual nature of the anxiety was very intimately connected with the breath as I've already described. And then all of the other activities that were happening in the body, the tension was also intimately connected with the breath. And then all of the thinking that was accompanying all of that was also connected with the breath. And so by being aware of that and then uh, allowing that mechanical overlay to release, then all of those other things also release. So from my perspective, they all are kind of one thing, actually. It's like one bundle and it's all tied together by the breath. So yeah. having that awareness of the breath kind of releases everything. Yeah, that's interesting. I never heard it put like that. The breath is like the core of the mechanical mm -hmm. habits, the mechanical actions. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. That's powerful stuff, man. I like that. 
Wow. I mean, do you feel as though that most of us are just sort of living some kind of mechanical lifestyle, like we're just sort of on autopilot? Uh, you know, life is being lived for us, and essentially that's where all of our problems and qualms come from. Obviously. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's quite obvious. I mean, it's obvious to us in the moment. We can talk about it now, but it doesn't seem so like, I mean, I don't know. It's like when you're in it, when you're in the mechanical actions, it's not so obvious. You know what I mean? Yeah. When you're when you're actually on autopilot mode, it's like it's not so obvious. You just lost in the lost in the emotions, you know? Yes. Yeah. But I do believe that, man. Like we're not living true to our core. We're not living true to really who we are, our dharma, you could say. And that's why we're suffering, essentially. Uh yeah. But it all does start with the breath. I guess that's the ironic, simple aspect of self-awareness and self-realization is it's literally always here for us. You can always become aware of your breath. And if you can do that, you can become aware of all the goings on, all the comings and goings of your life and thus change, right? That's what it's all about. If you want to talk about enlightenment, self-realization, what it's really all about is being able to change our life to live a more fulfilling life, right? Would you say to like, you know, not only just become aware, but also from that awareness, build a, just a healthier, happier, joyful, more peaceful life? Does that just naturally ensue, would you say? Um, well, in a sense, uh, it does, but it doesn't. So there, there are different ways that it can manifest. Uh, this is a thing that so there are different ways that self-realization can express and uh it's not just one way and i mean obviously there are many ways because there are many expressions many people mm -hmm. but also we could group those categorize them and say there are different categories of ways in which it can express so it may be that you know, for some people it can express as uh, there's a, a complete detachment. And so there's no longer any interest whatsoever in any of it. So it just sort of, it's just going to, there's a momentum, there's certain stuff that's just going to keep playing out for as long as there's, as long as this character is here. But there's no investment whatsoever in any kind of anything there. It's just, it's playing out. Yeah. So we can see that that happens for some. Um, but it can also happen that there can, there can be this realization, but then there's still, um, there's still some attachment. There's still desire that's unfulfilled that, uh, needs to be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And that's, those are the cases where, uh, there will be a conscious expression of the self in a way that one would say is beautiful or desirable or interesting or attractive. But um, I'm just making that clarification because let's consider somebody like Ramana Maharshi. Are you familiar with oh, yeah. Ramana Maharshi? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you know, Ramana Maharshi uh, sat in the, in, the, uh, in the basement of a temple and let insects eat his flesh. Mm. And mm -hmm. most of us would not consider that to be a beautiful or attractive thing. <laughs> no, not quite. But he was, he was in bliss. Mm. So, uh, but then for the rest of, for most of us, we can have those, um, we can have a certain degree of self-realization. But then, as I described, we still have a certain attachments and desires. And so we're not just going to sit in the, temple basement and let insects eat our flesh because, you know, we have, like I said, unfilled, unfulfilled desires. So we might have attachments to family or to certain things that we want to accomplish uh, or to the body. And so we need to fulfill those things because otherwise we're still just going to stay stuck and not complete that cycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Karma, we have to reap, right? 
as long as there's someone who's who's claiming it yes uh-huh yeah i mean that's the thing about somebody like ramana is that there was no longer anybody claiming it mm. huh. yeah that's an interesting way to put it as long as there's somebody who's claiming the karma it has to be reaped. yeah yeah that's good hmm it just makes me think like what i was in my head while you were saying that and like if we still have to reap our karma and there's still desires that still come about, you could say, then what changes with self-realization? Like if we still have to play our role per se, if we still have to do our thing here as Gary and as Joey, mm -hmm. um, then really what's the difference between a self-realized Gary and a non-self-realized Gary if the actions are still the same, if there's still karma to reap? Does the karma change? You know, is there different desires? Is is that what you would say? Well, yeah. I mean, the, the karma changes by definition because mm -hmm. it's, uh, I mean, not necessarily wholesale because obviously there's still some that's being claimed, but mm. um, much of it ceases to be claimed. Because yeah. a lot of, if you just pay attention, you'll notice that, if you think back in your life, uh, you can probably notice that you were, you talked about it like being on autopilot. So think about times in your life when you were just totally on autopilot. Yeah. And so you had all of these desires and you were seeking to try and fulfill those desires. Mm. But in retrospect, surely you can see that 90 plus percent of those desires were not actually yours. You didn't care at all about them. You thought you did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you would never find fulfillment in any of those things. You, you could get all the stuff, you know, get the, get all the power and the sex and the money and the, the cars and the stuff and whatever you, you thought you wanted. And it wasn't going to do it for you actually. So we could say in, in this self-realization, any level of self-realization, there has to be by definition, a falling away of a good percentage of that stuff. Yeah. I got you. Mm-hmm. But there still might be remnants, is what you're saying. You of know? course. Yeah, I got yeah. you. Yeah. Mm, I feel that. Yeah. So that's what the path is really all about. It alludes to, and maybe some may say over lifetimes, who knows, alludes to um, a letting go of one of selfish desire, of one that uh, claims the karma, as you said, like, uh, you know, just kind of. Uh, melting into the universe, letting go of your separateness and kind of realizing that you are the whole and living as the whole more so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. It's powerful stuff, man. Yeah. And that, is that something we all yearn for? Would you say like this is, if this is enlightenment, self-realization, all of us have that yearning inside to return to this wholeness and we're trying to fill it in ways that don't quite add up. Like you said, the money, cars, clothes, women. We try to fill mm -hmm. it in those ways, but they're just they're superficial and it doesn't work. But it's still the same desire. You know, it's still that, I don't even know if you want to call it desire, but it's still the mm -hmm. same yearning for wholeness. Yeah. I mean, I, the way you phrase that is interesting um, because it makes me wonder. I don't know for sure who's the you said some it says something about all is it true for all of us yeah. i don't know actually i assume but i don't know mm. um but certainly for it seems like for most if not all that's yeah. true yeah. seems like that to me too yeah and yeah, maybe not all but most of us mm -hmm. most of us yeah. Now, how do you think this is very esoteric and who knows the answer, but I'm going to ask you anyway, how do you think we got so lost? You know, like how did we dig our hole so deep into the ego? You could say like, how did we get here to lose ourself? Uh, essentially, uh, where does this all come from? You know? Um, well, as you say, it's, uh, it's, that's a difficult question. Um,
So um, to me, it seems obvious that there's all of this is based on desire. So there's a desire for experience. There's a desire for self-knowledge. And so this whole creation is that. It is that expression of that desire. Mm. And um, so then we could say we're lost. That's one way to view it. And from that perspective, it's valid. Because we can certainly have that experience of perceiving that we're lost. Um, but I don't see that doesn't seem to be the only way to see it. Uh, it could just as well be that it's just a, a phase of that creative process. Yeah. You know, in order to have that complete experience, there has to be that sense of not knowing. Mm. Otherwise it's not fulfilling. Yeah. What's, what's the point if you already know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> kind of like part of the part of the script it's part of the game mm -hmm. yeah mm. that's what makes it so miraculous to me so idea of finding out the true self with a capital t is uh i don't know it's like it was here all along like that's the miracle <laughs> you know and it always was and it always will be mm -hmm. oh so silly yeah, there's something because if you always knew, if you always knew from birth, it wouldn't be, it would still be miraculous because it always is. But there is something about the revelation coming in, personally speaking. And I think other people can attest to that, you know, getting the glimpse into mm -hmm. God, you could say, like, it's like, that's the, that's the aha moment. That's the eureka, I got it moment. And I, you're right. It's like, that's part of the script <laughs> for some reason to lose ourself. If you, if you want to say lose in order to find ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I also, like I said, I think because it's, it is a creative process. So yeah, there's something that's new that's occurring. Mm. Mm. And so it's, it's, that's why I, I'm, I'm saying, I don't think it has to be viewed as, being lost, I think it's just it's just new, mm -hmm. so it's not yet known. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I like that. I like that viewpoint a lot. When you come from the idea of it's a creative process, like at our at our you know highest essence, we are creators. This is this whole thing is the is a constantly transforming creative process. Um, yeah, then this is just like another stage in the creation another part of the creation yeah and uh we are we are the creation we are the creators itself we are just like in uh, another limb of the creation another layer another level of that mm -hmm. creation and yeah we're just figuring that out a new aspect of this creation it seems yeah that's also miraculous to me is finding out that we do have that essence of creation i feel as though that's what humans are if you want to put one label on what a human being is if just one just one i would say mm -hmm. we are creators that's what we are just plain and simple in all of our own unique ways billions and billions of us we all have this knack to create something out of seemingly nothing even though that's duality there's no such a thing as something and nothing but if you take like you know, a book or this podcast or anything. We create like something out of seemingly like our imaginations, like something that isn't something yet. And we, we make it. And that to me, yeah, that's like, that's something special about that to create something out of nothing. And that is, could also be looked at as a metaphor for our reality. Like this is something that came out of nothing. And we're just like a representation of that. We're like a addition to God. You know, we're like a, we're like a, uh, another step into, we are God-like beings in that way. We create mm -hmm. stuff out of stuff that isn't stuff yet. <laughs> well, that's true. Yeah. And it's, what's also true is that we're self-created, which I think is the most interesting thing. Um, but the thing that most of us overlook, because we tend to, and 
it seems to be a common story that uh, I'm just the way I am because that's just the way I am. But mm. we actually have choice. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be, you're not stuck with anything. You can change it all, anything you want. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's amazing because I don't know, um, I don't observe that in other beings. Mm. They don't seem to have that capacity for self-creation. No, unfortunately, no. Well, I don't know if it's unfortunate or not. It just is. But like a rock doesn't seem to be able to change itself. Mm. It seems to be what it is. And uh, a, do a dog seems to be what it is. You know, the dog does not seem to be able to, it, you know, the dog turns around before it lies down and it doesn't seem to be able to change that. Mm. Yeah. But a human can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's something very divine about that. Mm -hmm. Even though we there is stipulations to our creation, I can't just go like this and create anything out of thin air. We can like manipulate our environment. And that is something very, very special for sure. It's something very divine. And not, I would say not, you can't do that yet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> or you don't know that you can do it yet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, actually, in a sense, you are doing that all the time. Uh, because that's all of this is all of this is appearing and disappearing constantly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, it is all appearing out of thin air uh, through through and you're doing it. But <laughs> yeah. it is true that most of us haven't yet developed that degree of self knowledge to do it in that way. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I think that is what the path alludes to as well as is true self empowerment, mm -hmm. coming to terms with our creativity and really what that means. And uh, to me personally speaking, it's like a never ending process. It's like continually, it's a sense of continual growth. Like the creativity never stops, it gets more and more novel, I feel. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's just the way of things. The creativity just gets. The creativity just builds upon the creativity and, and so forth. It just keeps going. Yeah. That's another miracle right there, man. Yeah. Um, wow. This is good stuff. This is a good talk so far. <laughs> wow, man. Um, let me ask you this one. Kind of switch gears here a little bit. What is your background? Like, where do you come from in philosophical terms? Do you have any teachers or, uh, you know belief systems, ways of life that you follow or more attuned to? Uh, yeah. So I don't know how much you want me to tell you. Um, you want, I mean, just a five minute version. I don't know. Five minute version. <laughs> the basics. Well, so, uh, I, I, I grew up with, exposure to uh a lot of what's what's called new thought uh which is it, it's there are a lot of different uh organizations that are grouped in that category so like christian science unity uh religious science and then a lot of uh you know, Thomas Troward and uh, um, uh, even uh, uh, Emerson, mm -hmm. a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of these organizations and individuals who are kind of grouped in that. And the overarching theme there is that we are creative beings and that we create through mind, that mind is the medium through which all matter appears that matter is in fact mind solidified and uh, that we have these we have the ability to do that consciously and so that was i had early exposure to that and then i uh 
because I guess because of my familiarity with that, I continued to explore that into my early twenties. Uh, and so that was kind of my starting point. And then I branched out and got into transcendental meditation and, uh, which I practiced fanatically and had got myself into trouble doing that. Um, pretty big trouble, actually. It was not, not good. So anybody like psychological trouble. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. it, it was, it opened an enormous amount of anxiety. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So anybody who practices TM should follow their guidance and only do 20 minutes twice a day and not more than that. Mm -hmm. But I, I didn't follow that guidance. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I, I was doing that and then, uh, and then I, I, I got very interested in a lot of what would be considered Neo Advaita. So a lot of these, uh, Western modern, uh, non-dual teachings mm -hmm. and, uh, and then, and I got very kind of deep in to, uh, the teachings, of, the, the teachings of, of Papaji. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was a big, uh, that was a very big thing for me, very big in, uh, influence in, in my life and the presence of Ramana Maharshi, which I felt very strongly and uh, I had some very transformative experiences through that, which revealed that I had up to that moment, I had no clue who I was. I was completely asleep and uh, hopeless to do anything in my life, actually, of any real significance because I was totally lost. Uh, but having those experiences revealed something to me that was totally life changing. Mm -hmm. um, so that was an enormous influence. And that, uh, and then, and then I, um, became involved in 2019, I became involved in a, uh, uh, in the teachings of, uh, Siddha Thirmular, who's a South Indian saint, um, who, who this, the story is he entered into, uh, so he, his famous work is called the Tiro Mantram, and it's 3,000, roughly 3,000 verses. And the story is that it was one verse per year that he would, he would be in Samadhi for the whole year. And then one day of the year, he would come out of Samadhi to speak a verse to his disciples. Wow. Um, so I became involved in, in a, in his lineage in 2019, which has been a very big influence in my life. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Seems to be an eclectic mix, but dabbling a lot in Eastern philosophy, Eastern Advaita. Yeah. And, yeah. and well, not exclusive. I mean, for a long time, it was exclusive of what I would have considered to be Advaita, but, uh, now, now it's both, both Baita and Advaita. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you feel as though whatever philosophy it is, if it's pure, it's all teaching the same thing? Like there's one truth with many different names on it. Sort of. Yeah. I mean, at the essence, of course it has to be, but, mm -hmm. uh, but I think one mistake that I made, and I think a lot of people make, is thinking that, um, uh, so, so there's one, so there's one source, but there are many creations. Oh. And so the mistake that, I think people make is they think, oh, there's one source, therefore there's one creation. Not true. Mm. So that's good. Yeah. I never heard it put like that. Yeah. 
Man, that's good. You hit me with some really good ones today. There's one source. I mean, infinite creations, right? Yeah. Yeah. Ah. So what's the differentiate? Because you could say this one universe that we are, we're in and we are, is the creation. This isn't the one creation? No. So, yeah, I'm, a, I'm just a little confused by that because, and, I mean... And even even this one, we, this one universe is not one universe. I mean, because... Because th think about it, your universe and my universe are not the same universe. Mm -hmm. There might be some, there's something maybe shared. Which is the source. Well, obviously the source, but also because we're able to communicate, there's also some overlap in the creation. Yeah, it's I got very it. significant overlap, mm -hmm. but they diverge. So they're not the same. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they just happen to overlap. And then there may be, not maybe, there are those creations which are so divergent that your, your, our ability to perceive them is very small. Mm -hmm. mm, I get you now. Yeah. Makes sense when you put it into the context of overlap. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's good. One source, infinite creations. Wow. Hmm. Now, what do you think we are creating on Earth? Where is the overlap in our creations on Earth, you know? Uh, I mean, you could say, some people say we're creating dystopia. Um, some may say we're creating a utopia. Uh, is it somewhere in between? Like, what do you think this whole earth play is all about? What are we creating here? Well, it's up to us. Mm. Um, I mean, that's, that's the truth. And so there's different, different levels to perceive that from. I mean, one level is that I can, and both are, all the levels are valid levels to perceive from. But there, um, so we could say there's a level in which uh, we're all co-creators, which is, as I say, it's a valid, valid uh, way to perceive it. And so then what we're creating depends on a lot of factors, right? Like, uh, so each of us has a certain, we're exerting our willpower, we could say. Yep. in this creation and not everybody's willpower is equal so if i want to at the level of co-creation if i want to exert more influence then i need to increase my willpower and then i can exert a greater influence um but there's but then it's this there's kind of a power play right I, like it's, I've got to get more power in order to be able to have more influence so that I can have, have it turn out the way that I want at that level. Um, and that's okay. You know, that's, that's a valid level to experience from, but, uh, it's kind of stressful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's okay. Like I said, it's okay. And maybe it's, in, maybe it's necessary. So I'm not. I'm not dismissing it. I don't. Um, so these levels that I'm talking about, I think can they can be correlated to. Um, I mean, they're levels of consciousness. So obviously, they're there. We could say that there's a, a purely material level, which is a corresponds to a material level of consciousness. So if a person is functioning from that level, then it's all just about material stuff. Mm -hmm. If I can get enough stuff, if I can get enough bombs and i can get enough food and i can get enough whatever then i win yeah mm -hmm. and that's obviously it's very dense and it's the potentially most stressful level maybe they're more stressful but it's the most stressful common level that most that most humans would function from um we can certainly step it up from there and so this if we're looking at a level of power then power is 
still relatively stressful, but less stressful than just a material level. Right. Because then it's like, okay, I can exert influence. I don't just have to have stuff. I can exert influence. So yeah. I, I can, if I have power, I can exert that and I can have more influence that way. Um, but still relatively dense, limited way of perceiving. So higher, there are higher levels of consciousness, obviously. And those higher levels of consciousness are um, increasing at the higher levels, they become increasingly rarefied, so less dense. And so it's possible to have more leverage, less stress. Uh, and so, you know, just think about like at a heart level, then it's not, I'm not looking at, it's not all competition. It's not all power. It's not how am I going to, you know, win. Yeah. It starts to be about we're in this together. We're cooperating. Let's, you know, let's, let's figure this out. We can yeah. do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So relatively less stressful. Um, but then you can continue to increase that level of consciousness. So then um, at a high enough level, then it's not really even co-creative. It just becomes creative. So then it's no, there's no concern about other people and dominating and, and competition or any of that stuff. It just becomes, it's just my creation. Mm. So then there's not Joey and Gary as two different wills two different beings yeah there's they, they're just existing as characters in this play of consciousness mm. Mm hmm yeah i think that's what it is <laughs> two characters but f what are we creating i guess is uh what i'm getting at if we could try and pinpoint it if we are creating from the heart if that is an intention which Maybe that is yours or not, but I like to try and create from the heart per se. And uh, imagine a world where we're all creating from the heart, you know, kumbaya. But imagine that if we could get on that wavelength. I feel as though self realization kind of touches upon that, you know, like just living from the heart. If we do eventually reach a sort of critical mass someday where a large majority of us, or at least a little more of us, are creating from the heart. Like, what kind of world are we going to be creating? Like, I, I see it as quite different, you know, like all of us acting as actors or actresses from the heart. Like, what kind of show? The show will change up on Earth, it seems to me. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, like, uh, do you think, like, you know, I mean, is it, are we going to reach a place where there is peace on earth? I guess is what I'm asking. Are we, are we building heaven on earth here? Is that the highest form of creation? You know, is that what we're trying to create? If we're creating from a pure intention, you know, one with the source, are we <clears> creating <throat> when we're, we're all in it together and we actually resonate at that wavelength? I, I, it's, it's, that seems pretty obvious. Obvious to us. Well, yeah. I mean, but think about, um, so thing so fear is uh fear is a is a is a strong influence when at lower levels of consciousness because there's a perception that i'm separate i can be destroyed mm -hmm. you're in competition with me so i have to be watchful of you i have to make sure that you don't get what i need that you don't try to hurt me uh and so fear is the is the uh result of that lower level of consciousness it goes hand in hand with that lower level of consciousness mm -hmm. but that but the fear is not the uh is not the natural state fear is the consequence of that ignorance of the perception of separation so at higher levels of consciousness which are purer purer levels of consciousness because there's less distortion then there's less fear because the fear is just a distortion. So the natural state is more and more revealed at higher levels of consciousness. And we could use a word. I would use the word love to describe that yeah. natural state. Mm -hmm. So it, so from my perspective, it's a game of raising consciousness. Mm hmm it, it naturally happens as consciousness is raised that there will be less fear expressed and more love expressed. It just has to happen because that's 
structure of things. Yeah. So then, uh, so if, if, if the, um, aim is to raise consciousness, then naturally the result of that is an expression of love. Mm. Mm-hmm. Amen to that. Mm-hmm. I think that's where it's going. Seems like that's where it's going. Yeah. It does seem so, yes. Hmm. Not if you turn on Fox News, though. <laughs> well, I don't. I wouldn't know because I haven't turned on Fox News in a very Good long time. Good for you. Time. Yeah, don't recommend that to anybody. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Sometimes I do just for... Just for the lols, it's like let's let's check it out, you know. Check out pop culture. I don't know. It's interesting to, to view the illusion of Maya from a certain vantage point and to see it a sort of comicalness to it all. You know, I feel as though once you do view the world and its darkness from a wavelength or viewpoint of love, it's like sort of comical in a way. It's not laughing at it though, but you can see like how it is all distorted. You can see how it is just not functioning from the purity of love. And to me, I just have to laugh. I don't know. Some of it is just like, oh, if you only knew. I wish if you only knew. <laughs> but um, yeah. Sort of, yeah. But but it's also... Um, it's... it's it, so the the lower levels, I mean... So lower levels aren't bad. They're just, they're just denser. Yeah. And so, um, the, le the more clarity there is, the less distortion in there is, then those, those lower levels also start to come into alignment with that higher level expression. So if we're, if we're looking at that stuff and we, we see what the present appearance there is, then what we're seeing is those distortions that are taking place. And, and it's, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but it's also, it's maybe on a certain level, it's comical on another level though. It's, uh, terrible. It's terrible yeah. that there's, there's so much, uh, expression of, of fear and hatred and violence and all these things that, um, come from that distortion and from that yeah. ignorance. Mm. So, uh, I, I, but I, I, I do know that that's changeable. So that's what I focus on. Amen. Amen to that. Yeah. Not stagnant. I feel as though that's a, it's a trap for a lot of us. Personally speaking is the stagnancy of life and getting caught in. This is how it is. This is who I am. Yeah. And it usually comes from what we were told, you know, stories mm -hmm. and narratives from other people. Yeah. from ages past and uh yeah that's not true at all we're we're fluid we're fluid beings constantly changing and that's the beauty of it man that's the beauty of this life every day is different every moment every minute every second we are changing and it's all up to us to change too could seem harrowing right may seem a little scary to someone that doesn't know any better but to me that's actually like that's the greatest thing of all time like i can change myself it's all it's all up to me i can do this for sure, but you have to want it. We're all looking for an external savior. You know, we're all waiting for Jesus to come back, but Jesus comes back within. The Christ consciousness is within. And uh, yeah, I guess it's all up to us in our own accord to be able to find that, but we can. I think it is quite simple to find it. It may be a little tumultuous, maybe a little rocky. We might have to, you know, sort out some demons some skeletons in the closet, but it's worth it. And I think you could probably attest to that, you know, this whole path and figuring out who you are. Um, it's worth it, right? I believe so. Yeah. I don't see that there's really a choice. Mm. Um, I mean, there is a choice, but I don't see that there's a choice. Um, eventually I really, it, it, to me, it seems like it has to be worked out eventually. I think so. It's yeah. just a question of, when and uh to me sooner is better than later yeah i agree now would you say the darkness and the suffering is what brings us to that ultimately like the you know the, the darkness of the world 
the illusion of Maya is really what brings us into something that isn't an illusion? Um, it certainly can. Mm. Uh, I don't know if that's, I don't know for sure if that's always the case. There may be yeah. other things that, that do that. Mm -hmm. Um, like I, I, it's not my experience, so I don't know, but I could, I could imagine that, um, it might be possible to just be attracted to the light, so to speak, without having to be repulsed by the dark. Yeah. Uh, but that has not been my experience. My experience was I'm very repulsed by the dark. It was so awful, so heavy, so uh, terrifying, so miserable mm -hmm. that I realized eventually I can't do that anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's got to be another way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Another way. And the other way is the way. The way is the way. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um in that way, suffering is a sort of grace, or it can be. It can be, not always. And that's <clears throat> weird to say. Suffering is grace, but with a certain vantage point you can see how you can try to sort of transmutate the suffering into like we said, into change, into growth, to become a better person. So the potential is there, but it's not a guarantee. Yeah. Well, potential is there for all of us, Joey. I do believe that every single human being here on Earth, if one can do it, we can all do it. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, man. Um, you want to start to wrap this thing up? Whatever you want to do is good, good with me. All right. Do you have any last words? Anything you want to get off your chest for the pod or you just want to keep it at that? Uh, no, I'm good. All right. Well, I thank you for coming on here, Joey, and sharing your time, effort, and wisdom with me and anybody that listens in the future. Um, keep doing your thing, man. I really do wish you all the best. And uh, that's it. I'll put all your information down in the description for people to get in touch and check you out. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank Great. You. Thank you very much. It was very nice. All right. Peace and love to you and peace and love to anybody that listened this long. Goodbye.